Oh, okay, so despite the Despite the undeniable decline in British biodiversity, the State of Nature report actually found that over the last 50 years, we've lost 68% of our animals. Despite this, in amongst the doom and gloom, there are some rays of sunshine. And in this video, we're gonna take a look at one of Britain's most successful conservation stories, the resurgence of the red kite, who quite literally came back from the brink of extinction. And although a brilliant story, today there are still many challenges which still face the red kite and UK conservation generally. And we're gonna dive into all of that in this video. As always, thanks for stopping by. My name is Rob and this is Leave Curious, where we create content about rewilding in Britain. And if that sounds like something you're into, get the old subscribe button and a cheeky little tickle. Over the years, the red kite's relationship with the people of Britain has been a little bit up and down. So today they're protected and they're admired and there's thought to be around 6,000 breeding pairs across the UK. And for some context, it's thought to be around 35,000 breeding pairs globally. So the UK makes up a nice chunk of that. During medieval England, they were protected and cherished as street cleaners in the city of London. But by the 16th century, we saw a change in perception and red kites were labeled as vermin and a bounty was placed upon their beaks. Being accused of taking game and subsequently being captured, poisoned and shot out of the sky. And so much so they became a rarity, which led to them being targeted further for taxidermy specimens. And their eggs were stolen from their nests for private collectors. By the end of the 19th century, the red kite was extinct from Scotland, Ireland, and England. In 1903, the Kite Committee was established to protect the remaining kites, an isolated population hiding away in the hills of Mid Wales. Later research into the DNA of this population found that at one point, its future relied on just one breeding pair. And despite the best efforts of the Kite Committee, red kites in the UK just weren't recovering. And for the first part of the 20th century, we didn't see any more than 20 breeding pairs. The bottlenecking of the gene pool and a mixed mitosis outbreak decimated the kite's main food sources. And this population, although sparse in number, somehow it managed to hold on. But it wasn't until the 1990s that the red kite situation really started to look up. In 1992, on a Welsh farm, Chris Powell unintentionally did something remarkable for this species. His pooch had been dispatching rabbits, which he decided to throw out in a quiet field to occupy the crows away from his newborn lambs. But it wasn't the crows that came for the meat, it was a pair of red kites. And it wasn't long before the RSPB came calling and asked Chris to establish the first official feeding site for kites, which he did. And every day, rain or shine, the kites were fed rabbits and soon meat from the local butchers. And with the Welsh population growing in strength, the RSPB and the NSEC made, at the time, the controversial decision to reintroduce some more kites from Europe. Controversial because the kite was long thought to be an upland specialist, and there was a lot of speculation about how they would fare being reintroduced to the lowlands of the UK. But this, but this is just an example of how nature is trying to fit into the landscape that we've made for it. Just because the species is interacting with the landscape in one way, this doesn't mean that it's the only way, a most optimal way for it. But the decision was made, and during the early 90s, 93 birds from Sweden and Spain were reintroduced. And of course, over the next 30 years, it worked. You'll now see red kites thriving in our lowland ecosystems. And a fun little side note for you, in the past couple of years, some British kites have been translocated back to Spain to help bolster the populations there. The original Welsh population began to boom, as did the reintroductions, and this once marginalized species that was quite literally on the brink of extinction have returned. But what this project enabled the British public to do is to experience nature. Giggering Farm in Wales sees 150,000 people a year come and watch the kites at feeding time. And as you know, I like to go on about the importance of people experiencing nature because ultimately it's our experiences which inform our decisions. And today, more than ever, we need as many nature-based decisions being made. Despite red kite populations over the past 30 years increasing by over a thousand percent, there are still some threats they face today. So compared to strong populations in the south of the UK, up north on the Black Isle, they're struggling. And the reason? Illegal shooting and poisoning. In 2014, a police investigation found some extremely toxic and banned pesticides to be the reason for killing 16 raptors. The killings have been found to be in close proximity to shooting estates. 
Now, a study from 2010 found that between the years 1989 and 2006, and this is right at the time of their populations booming and recovering, it found that 40% of dead red kites died as a result of poisoning, with radio tags for surveying the birds being cut off, meaning that whoever did this, they just did not want to be caught. The persecution of predators by gamekeepers isn't a new threat, whether if it's a lynx, wolf, or bird of prey, they see them as a threat to their business of shooting grouse and pheasants. Now, whether if you think this industry is cruel, outdated or otherwise, it has long been a part of Scottish culture. And as we move forward, there's no reason why it can't continue to be, but it simply cannot dominate the way that we govern our landscapes. And it certainly cannot lead to the illegal killings of wild animals using dangerous chemicals. The way I see it, what with the Elm Scheme being introduced and with more and more money and attention going into rewilding and nature-based solutions to govern our lands for all living things, for everyone, unsustainable and environmentally restrictive land management, such as gamekeeping, will become more and more marginal because we are fast approaching the time that any unjustified land management will be sidelined, not out of choice, but out of necessity. The red kite is an example of how when we make the right decisions, we can do some good for biodiversity, but it's also a reminder that we have to keep working and fighting for a wilder world. Thanks for watching, leave curious.